There's a story in the Bible about the potter. He's making this pottery and he, like the potter like messes it up. And then it goes on to say, well, the, the potter, as he's, he's you know, slips, messes up the clay, he makes it into something different that was pleasing to him. So it's like, dude, I messed up. And I, it's like, no, dude, God still wants to not even can or will, he wants to use you. And oh, by the way, it brings him great joy yes. and delight. I think he likes to use some of your things that you think disqualify you. Bingo. My dad was an alcoholic and got sober when I was 15 years old, stayed sober the rest of my life. And not too long ago, I woke up in the middle of the night, I'd written my book about my dad and, and the power of one more. And I woke up crying and my wife's known me since we were little kids. She goes, what, what's wrong? I said, someone helped daddy. And she went, what? Someone helped my dad get sober. That person has no idea that they did something great with their life. The ripple effect is, I'm his son. I've reached millions of people. They probably have no idea. The more amazing thing is what qualified this person to help my dad. They were an alcoholic at one time. Hmm. They were a drug addict. They were a liar. They lived in the shadows. God repurposed their mess and actually used the things they were the most ashamed of to change other people's lives and change their life. We start using our mistakes or our failures or our averageness even as like these disqualifiers from our future when the reverse is actually true. Welcome back to the show, everybody. So I watch this guy on TV a lot. And I find myself when I'm watching him, and if you're watching the video version of this, you're already doing it. I told this when I met him. You just start smiling. He has this extremely infectious smile about him, which is interesting because it comes in this package of this gigantic man. But he's just a remarkable spirit. And I'm so excited because today is really about changing your life. And if I could just define today, it's about changing your life. In fact, if I could define my whole program it's about changing your life. And today we get to get right into the heart of it with a man who's done that in his own life, comes from a remarkable family, NFL football player, incredible motivational speaker, TV personality, amazing son, brother, husband, just a remarkable man. And he's written a book that I went through in one night. One night I read Change Starts With You, Following Your Fire to Heal a Broken World. And the author of that book is sitting right across from me right now, Sam Acho. Welcome to the show, brother. I'm so glad to be here, Ed. Thank you. So good to have you. What made you write the book, number one? I'm curious. Why this book? Why right now? Um, it was hard, to be honest. Like, so this is my second book. My first yep. book is called Let the World See You, How to Be Real in a World Full of Fakes. Yep. And that book was really just an overflow of my heart. Like there was, mm. there was just life was happening, and that book really was therapy. Mm. This book was more of this response to really in 2020, mm -hmm. uh, George Floyd, yep. COVID, everything, and this thing of like, man, I started doing stuff in the community, mm -hmm. and people started saying, Sam, how did you do that? Or how did you get past some of these things? Or what made you want to do that? There would be schools, universities, mm -hmm. um, organizations that would be asking me, hey, how did you do what you were able to do? Yeah. And so this idea of what if I could write some of it down. Not that it's this perfect example, but this idea of, okay, we all want to see change in the world or in ourselves, mm. but we either one, don't know how, or two, I think a lot of us are afraid to address some of the things that keep us stopped and yep. keep us stuck. Well, the thing about the book too, that was interesting was you do two things I love. Number one, you're like, hey, no, you, actually you yeah. can change the world. You can change your life. Cause I think oftentimes people think it's for a dude to play in the NFL like you only. Or like, hey, man, this guy Ed Milet's had a bunch of financial successes. So, yeah, he could do it. But me, not me. So that's the one part I loved. But the other part that I think is requisite is you actually take them through steps of how to do it. Yeah. It's not like just like rah, rah, dreams and bubblegum and rainbows. There's actual steps in this book of how to do it. And I want to go through some of them. I wanted to read the book, so I don't want to go through all of them. But there's terminology in this book and ways that you frame and phrase things I've not ever heard in this space before. Mm -hmm. And I was surprised how you started out the book. You actually started out the book by saying, big dreams requires architects. I've never heard that term before when it comes to a dream. So go ahead and rift on that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, so like we all have, a lot of us have dreams. Mm -hmm. And a lot of us have goals and things that we desire, things we want to see changed. And we oftentimes don't know how to get to wherever we want to get to. Yeah, right. And you think about it, I'm not, you know, I, I, I talk about in the book, I said, like, I love building. Mm -hmm. But I'm not this car guy that's, like, in the shop and building cars. Or I'm not, like, the I got a, one of my old coaches, he loves, like, Lego sets is his thing. Like, he's yeah. like, man, I could work on Lego set for days, for yeah. weeks. Like the big, but I, I like building people. Mm -hmm. 
I care about people. And you talk about even the idea of change starts with you. It's like, oh, that's a nice idea. It's like, no, dude, you. Like you, like even you, Ed. Mm Mm-hmm. Like with your platform and, and your history and your background, like you're making change. The people listening, like change starts with you, not just this general idea, but you need help. Yeah. I need help. We all need help. And so this idea of these architects, these people around us who can help us build the dreams we're trying to build and not just like, okay, give me all your resources and we'll do it. It's like, hey man, like I need, I'm scared. Or hey, I think this is a great idea, but can you help me through this? As I was on my way here, there was a friend of mine who I called about. To, there's some stuff like I, you know, I do stuff on TV, and I'm mm. hanging out at this conference with a bunch of athletes. One of one of these athletes I I I, I played with mm. came up to me today, and he's like, "Hey Sam, like you do great. I love you, but mm. there was one thing that you said about me on TV, and I I didn't like it. Mm. And I'm like, why well, didn't I didn't say that? He's like, Yeah, you did. <laughs> and I'm sitting there like, I really don't. So I was, I was going back. Re- but I, that's when my friends say, what do I do in this situation? Mm-hmm. How do I like, and, and, you know, because that could get somebody stuck. Okay, maybe I need to get out of the industry. Do I need to pop? And so this idea of, okay, I need people around me who can speak the truth to me. Mm-hmm. Tell me when I'm wrong. Mm-hmm. Sometimes tell me when I'm right and just to ignore them and to keep on going. Mm-hmm. But also people who can remind me of who God made me to be and how God made me. Mm-hmm. Like one of my friends, he. So I'm, we talked about TV and the smile yeah. and joy. He says, dude, get on that TV. Mm-hmm. Whatever you can do, like get on that screen. Mm-hmm. I'm like, no, dude, I got family and kids. He's like, yes, like take care of your family. Love your wife. Mm-hmm. Love your kids. But, dude, God's doing something there. Yes. So find a way. And so mm-hmm. people like that, men, women, mm-hmm. they're the architects. And I say help me build the dream that I feel like God put inside of me. Here's one of the interesting things that you say in the book about the architects, though which I never really thought about, but the best mentors I've had, Mm -hmm. if you call those architects, have done, they actually help you also understand what it's going to cost. And you talk about that in the book. Yeah, I read the book, right? This is one of these interviews where I go, hey, I read the notes. I read the book, right? And you talk about the cost part of it as well. So talk about that a little bit because what I find is a lot of people with their dreams – they stay in negotiation mode the entire life. They're like, is it worth it? Is it worth it? Is it what's it cost to me? Oh my gosh, I missed this. I did this. And they're negotiating the price tag of their dream their entire life. Hmm. Rather than just from the darn beginning go, this is going to cost certain things. Hmm. Right? And once you've negotiated that price, I think it gives you freedom. But you talk about these architects helping you with the cost as well. Yeah, they help you count the cost. Hmm. Any dream, any decision. There are consequences, Hmm. positive and negative consequences. Hmm. Anything you want to go after and build, it's going to cost you something. Hmm. My wife, I'm super extroverted. I will hang out with anyone all the time and talk (laughs) forever. My wife is is relatively introverted. Hmm. She's like, hey, man, people can be draining, right? My good friends are – so early in our marriage – I would want to take her to all the things and do all the stuff and like mm. and and she would go, but there came a time where it was like, hey, like I want to be home, mm. or I say, okay, you could stay home and I'll go do these things, but it was like, hey, by the way, every time you say I'm gonna go, 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 you're choosing them mm. over me, which which is totally okay and go do, your, but it was this thing of like there is actually a cost associated associated with decisions, mm. and so in the same way with our dreams, I love being on TV, I want to be on ES, I'm on ESPN right now, I want to do all the things and be like the face of ESPN, all the things. Mm. but there's a cost with that. And one of the costs has been, man, I've traveled a, a good bit these last few years mm-hmm. during the fall, during football season. Mm-hmm. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, I'm in studio. Sunday in studio. Sometimes Monday in studio. Mm-hmm. Talk with my family about that. Talk to my wife. But it's like, hey, that's a cost. But then you start saying, okay, is it worth it? Yes. Right? Because once you once you count that cost and once you understand like the oh my gosh. the value of it, yes. you realize, okay, I can we can do this. My wife and I had a conversation. Okay, we're gonna be you're gonna be traveling. Mm-hmm. I'll hold down the fort. You travel, but make it worth it. So good. As opposed to the alternative of, well, I don't know, and maybe I should, maybe I shouldn't. Dude, make a decision. Reevaluate after. Okay, here's how brilliant that is. I have a talk that I gave for many, many years that I believe so deeply in that when I was broke, mm-hmm. I had no money. And you talk about broken people, we're gonna go there in a minute too. But when I was broke, here's how I chose things in my life based on what it cost. So I would walk into a store, I wouldn't get what I wanted. I would get what I could afford. So I'd flip price tags all the time. And I think sometimes a a poverty mindset in terms of bliss and happiness and achievement is that way as well. We're we're always negotiating whether it what it cost us rather than the distinction of is it worth it? Is it worth it? I think successful and happy people negotiate the worth. It always surprises me when someone's pursuing a dream and then they're shocked twenty percent of the way in that there's a price to be paid. Mm-hmm. That there's a cost. Like, why not? This is what the, what's brilliant about your work. There's going to be a cost, so negotiate it up front. I was having dinner last night with a someone that you and I both look up to that's mm-hmm. in the sports space, I was telling you. And I would consider him one of my architects. Mm-hmm. And I'd like to think maybe I'm one of his. Mm-hmm. And we spent a decent percentage of the dinner 
discussing what our current life choices cost us. Mm. And then him reassuring me back that it was worth it. And we would talk out loud about it. And I left that dinner more determined about my current vision, more determined about my current dream, because I was more aware actually of what the cost was. So you're a billion percent right, guys. The application of this at the highest levels, I was just doing this last night. So Sam's 100% right about it. Now, a couple other questions I want to say before we even move off the first darn chapter is you talk about, you said in the book, you said this book at its core, I'm quoting from it, is about taking things that are broken, systems, situations, people, culture, like what we've saw in 2020, systematic things in our world, and you say, and working towards making them whole. Sometimes brokenness is on the outside, cities, countries, and communities in which we live, work, and play. Other times that brokenness is within. And until we address the things that break our hearts, the things that bring us pain, we won't be able to do what we were put on this earth to do. And you ask, what breaks your heart? And then you go into some other questions. I, that's not normal in a dream book. Why do you have that in there? Because this is not a dream book. Mm. Um, this is a overcoming book. Mm overcoming the obstacles on the outside, mm. but also overcoming ourselves. Yeah. Before you make any kind of change, we could use that word, you could mm. say progress, whatever word you want to use, you need to address the insecurities within you and the brokenness within you. And sometimes that brokenness came from people close to you. Mm. Maybe it's family members. Maybe it's like a dad who was present or wasn't present. Maybe it was a mom who who was there, maybe wasn't there. Maybe it was siblings. Like Maybe it was something that happened as a child. And all of a sudden, like your worth that God gave you, that inherent worth, like, you know, like you know, I remember like when you know, Jesus gets baptized, like mm. heavens open up. This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Mm. There's another verse in Matthew 18 or so where they're giving an example about paying taxes and all the things. And they're asking Jesus, like, well, should we pay? Should we not? And he's like, essentially, he's like, man, the sons are free. Like, y'all are good. But we're still going to pay. But it's like, I'm God's ch child. I have inherent worth and value. And somewhere down the line, I set that aside and I started to believe a lie. The lie that either I wasn't enough or wasn't good enough or wasn't smart enough or, or I was too much. And God said, no, nope, you are who I made you, but I need you to like set aside the lie and, and pick up the truth. And so this is not a dream. Oh, you know, dream big. All these mm -hmm. dreams come true. No, this is a hey. It's gonna. That's why this book was hard for me to write. Mm -hmm. It was hard. Like the, like it was hard. Before, my first book. I'm not saying it was easy, but it, the words flowed out of my heart. Mm -hmm. This one was very challenging because I have to address some of the stuff inside of me. Mm -hmm. The subtitle, "Following Your Fire to Heal a Broken World." Like I talk about, man, that God given fire. Sometimes we it gets put out. Mm -hmm. How do we reignite that match? And so, life is hard. And dreams are real. Mm -hmm. And if we want to go in and live out those dreams or even find them again, mm -hmm. we have to go back to those places and address those broken pieces inside of us. There's a story. Uh, I don't remember Gosh, the verse right so now. Good, I'm telling you, man, there's yeah. a story in the Bible about the potter. And it's like this dude, he's making these, this pottery and he messes, like the potter like messes it up. Mm -hmm. And you think, oh, no, I'm done. I'm screwed. This is horrible. And then it goes on to say, well, the, the potter, as he's, he kind of slips and messes up the clay. He makes it into something different that was pleasing Damn. to him. So it's like, dude, Jeez. I messed up. And I, it's like, no, dude, God still wants to not even can or will. He wants to use you. And oh, by the way, it brings him great joy yes. and delight. I think he likes to use some of your things that you think disqualify you. Bingo. So, and you talk about this in the book. And I, I'll be honest with you, I'm reading the book going, man, because... I'll give you a quick example, and then I'll let you talk about it. My dad was an alcoholic and got sober when I was 15 years old, stayed sober the rest of my life. So one of the reasons I believe so deeply a humans can change their life, I watched my hero do it, mm. right? And not too long ago, I woke up in the middle of the night. I had written my book about my dad and, and the power of one more. And I woke up crying, and my wife's known me since we were little kids. She goes, what, what's wrong? I said, someone helped daddy. And she went, what? I said, someone helped my dad. I never thought about this before. Some precious human being helped my dad in the lowest moment of his life. He was either going to take his life or lose his family. I don't even know where it happened, a bar, an alley somewhere. Someone helped my dad get sober. And she goes, that's incredible. And I said, that person has no idea that they did something great with their life. The ripple effect is, I'm his son. I've reached millions of people. They probably have no idea. The more amazing thing 
is what qualified this person to help my dad. They were an alcoholic at one time. Hmm. They were a drug addict. They were a liar. They lived in the shadows. God repurposed their mess and actually used the things they were the most ashamed of to change other people's lives and change their life. So oftentimes what we do, you're right, this worth gets stripped away, and then we start using our mistakes or our failures or our averageness even as like these disqualifiers from our future. When the reverse is actually true, right? Isn't that the case? That is 100% the case. Mm. I, there's a point in my book, and I'm saying this because I just, I just found this out. Mm. I talk about this lady, this older woman named Cindy, like 80, 70-year-old, 60-year-old woman, and how in the book, and this is like, I, it's great, but mm. I didn't know this until now. So I talk about, man, like she, she had a friend, and her friend, you know, she you know, a white woman, grew up in Houston, and like kind of like race with things, and you know, different water fountains, and she had a friend who essentially like Cindy's like working on like learning more about race and mm. George Floyd how they, and she has this friend and this friend's like oh, I don't like black people and this and that like it was like you know she's like old school thinking mm-hmm. and Cindy you know, stood up to her and said something and I wrote in the book and, and that's sometimes the cost of like mm. of like change mm. and I was like maybe Cindy lost a friend that day I don't know if she did or didn't well I, I sent her a copy of my book and she read it obviously mm. and I told her about that section and she said hey Sam thank you so much for writing this, but this story actually does have a happy ending because my friend, after that conversation, we stayed in touch and all of a sudden she's learning more about people who look different, th- different mm. than her, who think differently. And now all of a sudden because of me, mm. like saying something and saying, hey, let's actually learn. Now her story is changing. Mm. Who knows about her kids and her grandkids and her great grandkids. And so this idea of our mess even I go back to my friend doing stuff on TV. Like I, I was, I, I was hurt by hearing this guy who was my teammate say, "Man, why would you say that?" Mm. And but he confronted me, mm. and I get a chance to go and and I said I was going watching. Did I say it or not? But even go and say, "Hey, man, let's talk about this," because mm. I don't ever want to be that kind of person. Mm. I don't want that to be. And if it is, I'm sorry and I apologize. But it's almost this deal of places where we're afraid or we feel broken. Mm. God wants to use so true for His glory. Well, you literally say, "I'll let you finish this censor." sentence everyone i want you to hear this this is like this is going to go viral this sentence right here because no one phrases things this way you are the answer to someone's prayers come on you are Hmm. you are your your action Hmm. your movement your discernment your touch Hmm. your platform is what someone has been waiting for. And you have no idea. Yes. You have no idea. That dream that you have, that you've been a little bit like timid about and trepidation, there are people on the other side of those dreams. Yeah. Like your dad. That's exactly the example I'm thinking of. I'm telling you, man. Like your yeah. dad wanted, he didn't want to be yeah. an alcoholic, yeah. but there was someone who said, you know what? I'm going to go talk to this guy. That person was an answer literally to my prayers hmm. as his son. Hmm. Literally. Hmm. That's... I'm reading your book and I was getting emotional. One, there's actionable things. At my age now, in my experience, I put things through my, do I believe that meter? Do you know what I mean? Yes. I'm 51. If I, and everything I'm reading, I'm like, that's right. That's right. That's a way better way to say it. I've never heard that before. That person, and by the way, I know who they are now. Ironically, I can't say his last name because it's an anonymous program, but I'll just say something interesting. My name's Ed. My dad's name's Ed. My grandfather's name's Ed. And the person who helped my dad get sober, his name is Ed. Hmm. That's not a very common name anymore, right? Hmm. And so I actually know who this person was. But you say something. You just used to go in there for a minute about what a coach said to you about, I'll let you finish this, about, hmm. you know, we know with your, not just your words, but other things in life, whether you're really pursuing your dream. Because lip service is really common right now. Really common on Instagram is living the dream. I'm going for it. I got a vision. Big thoughts. Big life. You know, all that stuff. But there's a separator. Yeah, you follow with your feet. (laughs) So good. You follow with your feet. It's so easy to talk. Our words, it's just like like this whimsical, like, oh, yeah, I'll 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 be there. Mm -hmm. Or, yeah, I got you. Or I'll pray for you. Pray for you. Mm -hmm. It's a lot harder but more fulfilling to move Mm -hmm. and maybe that movement is just getting on your knees to actually pray for that person or just folding it or even closing your eyes and even Mm -hmm. praying or maybe it's that movement of you know i want to get in shape oh yeah i'm gonna start working okay actually like getting up walking around going to the gym Mm -hmm. um my coach said it you you follow with your feet 
you fo- you don't you don't follow with your words and your action mm-hmm. with your words and your thoughts. Mm-hmm. Movement is what says, "Oh, you are for me, you're against me." Mm-hmm. Yeah. Period. I also think the footwork um our friend Inky Johnson yep. says this. It shouldn't be conditional mm-hmm. in sports. Everybody's willing to follow with their feet when it's 23-7 and you're leading. Right? Yeah. Are you willing to follow with your feet when it's 28-3, you're losing, and now you're on the bench and some dude's playing in front of you? Do you follow with your feet then? What I'm saying is that I want everyone to hear this because you're like, yeah, I heard that. I should probably work harder. Yeah, but is your work ethic conditional? Is it too conditional that everything's got to be dialed in right? Everyone's got to be supporting you. The wind's got to be blowing at your back. You better have had some momentum. Or do you do you have the ability to follow with your feet when you're when it feels like you're losing? When it feels like people are against you, when you get criticism yeah. from a friend, yeah. then what are your feet doing? That's usually the separator, right? And when you're alone, mm. when you're alone, because it's that journey you talk about. There's a lot of there can be a lot of loneliness mm. on this journey of like, do I do want to see something change in my life? Because mm. that's ultimately saying the way I, the way it was and who I was with and what I was doing wasn't working. Mm. So I'm going to go a different way. Mm. And even if no one's with me, will I still go? If I'm getting criticized, will I still like? I have a joy. I love being on. TV. I have a joy, like like the joy of the Lord is my strength. But I have a joy when I'm on that TV. And will I let this criticism that, that maybe I think the guy was inaccurate? And I'll go back and double check. I spent an hour or so. This trying is to figure, really bugging. This you. is bugging me. <laughs> but it's like, but it's like, nah, dude. Like, mm. okay, are you gonna hide? Mm. Are you gonna still still be a light? Mm. <laughs> are you gonna Are you going to hide? Mm. Are you going to still be a light? Mm. Are you going to address that thing? Or are you going to just oh, you know, blow it off? Mm. And sometimes you need to blow things off. Yeah. So that's kind of where I'm like, how I'm coming into this space is this idea of it will be lonely. Yeah. At times, mm-hmm. maybe for a long You're time. You're right. Um, it's funny you say that. I'm writing right now about a new book. It's amazing how our brain is connected today in our hearts. And I was thinking the other night about what I wanted to write in a chapter, and I'm actually writing a chapter about how pursuit of your ultimate destiny, your bliss, your whatever it is right now, is pretty lonely most of the time. And to just sort of know that going in. I think oftentimes people, like I'd ask you this too. You said earlier that friend who says, hey man, here's the course correction, right? Do you know how, or would you give any advice? Someone asked me this a lot. I don't have a great answer for it. How do you distinguish between like a hater, Mm -hmm. just take this teammate of yours for a minute. I'm sure he's a good friend. But let's just be real. You've had a really good post and you had a great NFL career mm-hmm. you've had a really flourishing post NFL career mm-hmm. you have a great family you've got this second book out now it's going to be doing amazing you're on television probably there's that line is this dude a little hatery jealousy or is he giving me constructive feedback right and even I think most people want to know how, how do you distinguish do you think there's a way to distinguish between those things I do mm-hmm. and I think it's the people who know you best will mo- not always mm-hmm. but most oftentimes they will be the ones the voices you need to listen to mm-hmm. i was with a couple last night so at, uh, nfl a couple and this guy you know great player he's gonna have a long career but you could tell his wife um like pours into him mm-hmm. and that's the voice he listens to and should listen to mm-hmm. now there may be a lot of other voices but there's got to be that one mm-hmm. right. that you trust mm-hmm. and 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 Thankfully, I have a few. I have two or three. Mm-hmm. Like when it gets bad, mm-hmm. when it hits the fan, mm-hmm. it's two or three who I'll reach out to. And they've, I've been knowing them for about – some of one of them, one of the guys I've known them for about 10 years. There's a lady, a girl, a woman I know, known her for about 15 years. Like I've known them, and mm-hmm. they know me. Mm-hmm. They know my character. Mm-hmm. So it's like, no, Sam, that's not you, mm-hmm. and this is. Mm-hmm. So do this. Mm-hmm. So there is a way to distinguish the, the haters versus the people who are trying to constructively build you up. I'm not going to say criticize. I think they're t- people who know you mm-hmm. – They'll build you up. They'll speak the truth, but they'll say it in love. I love that. I have friends who listen to the show and will go, hey, uh, you know, you asked that question. But from a woman's perspective, I wish you would have also asked this one. I'm like, thank you for mm-hmm. telling me that. Mm-hmm. Or other buddies or guy friends of mine will be like, hey, man, you asked that one question. I would have loved if you followed up. And I'm like, no, give me that But feedback. you see the difference, Ed? Yes. They're offering a solution. You're right. You're right. They're offering a solution. Not just the critique. Not just the critique. Very good. You're right about that. If that's- you just think, I mean, as I think, it's like most of my, and sometimes I say, man, I may not have one, but it's. Okay, here's what if you did this? Hmm. Or what if you thought about it this way? Or what if you just took a like took a beat? Hmm. As opposed to that criticism hmm. can be loud, but notice the criticism it rarely ever is a solution. Or the solution they give you is just stop altogether. You're right. 
And that's not love. You're right. That's not love. Everyone go rewind that about 45 seconds back. You know, I've probably asked or talked about haters versus constructive criticism maybe like 60 times in my career, and that's the best answer ever. Hmm. The people that are supporting you actually have some sort of solution-based proposition for you Hmm. instead of just the critique or just stop. Man, that is really, really good. Really good. Now, in your life, i got to think a couple of these people are your parents. Yeah. I've read about you. Um, what a remarkable family. First off, you've also, I don't I only know of you and your brother. Are there other siblings? Yeah, we have two older sisters. Yeah. So yeah. I, obviously your brother's also immensely success, successful, Emmanuel. Great NFL career also. Didn't quite do, was it shot put or whatever? You yeah, the shot put. Yeah. He's number two. You're number one <laughs> by like a foot or inches or something like that. Yeah. But also has a flourishing TV career. Also is a booming author. He's a thought leader in the space, uh, cultural leader. Um, you're both just remarkable men. Nigerian family. What struck me about your family was I believe your parents would have you guys go do a mission trip, I think every single year as children. And I think just speak a little bit about what your upbringing gave you, your parents, and also that experience itself of of service and taking you back probably to a place that gave you, which you write about in the book, perspective. Mm -hmm. We need it. Mm -hmm. We all need perspective. And there are different ways to get it, but no matter how you get it, go find it. Since I was little, I, my parents were born and raised in Nigeria. I was born in Dallas, Texas. But since we were little, every Christmas and New Year's, we would spend in Nigeria. Mm-hmm. And we would go visit. I was just visit family and celebrate. And Christmas is different there. We do Instead of just a one-day open presents, it's like an entire week. From, from New Year's, from Christmas Eve to New Year's Eve. Almost like a Hanukkah version yeah, yes. of Christmas, sort of. Yes, yeah, you go and yeah. celebrate different people's houses. Like mm-hmm. It's just like huge celebration. It's mm-hmm. amazing. And so we would do that every single year since I was a kid. But in the summer... I was in the Christmas in Christmas time. Summer, my parents were going to do these medical mission trips. My dad started this this ministry. Like they 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 were born and raised in Nigeria from nothing, came to America, and in a lot of ways lived the American dream. But they remembered home, and people still hurting home. And so they started like bringing doctors and nurses and surgeons. Then they said, "What if we could do more?" And started building this hospital. Now there's Nigerian doctors and nurses who work there. And when I was 15, they brought me on that trip for the first time. They said, okay, we think you're old enough to go. And, you know, my younger brother, 13, sister. So they brought us on this trip. And I remember the school I went to, I, I switched schools. Like, there's predominantly, like, it's a private school. Like, a lot of, like, affluent kids. And and I remember going there and meeting a, a young boy. I was 15 at the time. They met a young boy. I thought he was probably eight or nine years old, real skinny, kind of like dingy, like, t- tank top and stuff. And we're talking, little kid from the village. And. I'm like, hey, what's your name? Like, as we're playing soccer or whatever. He's like, I'm Samuel. Mm-hmm. Oh, wait, Samuel. I'm Samuel, too. Mm-hmm. Good to meet you, man. Like, mm-hmm. how old are you? I'm 15. And I'm like, mm-hmm. like, I didn't choose to be born where I was born. I didn't choose. Like, this dude, I'm probably twice his size. This dude, like, same shirt, same sandals, same thing for months. We drinks water from the street. Like, mm-hmm. and so it was this thing of perspective. Mm-hmm. So ever since I was a kid, that moment has never left me, and it never will. It can't. I didn't choose to go on that. My parents said, no, we need you to come and see. Hmm. So what are the things that you need to go and see or your people need to go and see or your kids need to go and see? Where are the places? Because there's joy in that. That shaped me. Yeah, I clearly. Part of, it clearly. Hmm. Part of the reason we talked about it was a medical mistrip then turned to this hospital, like, by God's grace, I got a chance to win a couple awards in the NFL and all these things and, like, raise money, do fundraisers to help build that hospital. Like that shaped me. And it started with my parents yeah. saying, and I don't know if they did this intentionally or not. I'm sure maybe they did, maybe they did, but it's saying, we need to we need you to see more than what meets the eye. Yeah. Well, if they didn't do it intentionally, they were pretty damn blessed and pretty damn brilliant. But if you are listening to this and you have children or are going to have children, what a life lesson to do some things that give your children some perspective and to give yourself perspective. That perspective instantly will, by the way, give you the emotion of gratitude. You'll instantly be grateful for the things in your life that you take for granted every single day. To think that you've met a boy that's got the same age, same background as you, and he looks nine years old physically because of his, frankly, lack of nutrition in his life and just the blessing of being able to eat decent food in your life. Never mind, because in the book you do say, you actually said the word American Dream with your mom and dad, but then in the book... This is shows how like we should have lives that can exceed even our parents if we if we live correctly. You actually say the American dream may not be enough. That there's more than just like, hey, roof over your head, at least in this country. 
that just the notion of a roof over your head and watch Netflix and chill and have a barbecue on the weekend, that there's more to life than that. It doesn't satisfy. Mm-hmm. That's the more than anything, like that dream doesn't satisfy. Like we, we were made, we were made for more. Mm-hmm. And Ed, you get that. Yeah. And I think a lot of people listening, they understand we were made for more. We, we were taught to believe that, okay, if I just get enough money, make enough money, I get this house. And if I get married, then if I have kids, then if I, you know, I'm the perfect husband or perfect wife, then I will. It's like, no, dude, there's something beneath the surface. Gosh. And and if we keep on chasing that thing, it will never. I've I played in the NFL for nine years. The average is three. Yeah. I've made a lot of money, been around people that made a lot more than me. Mm-hmm. And there's it doesn't satisfy. You're right. It doesn't. Mm-hmm. But there is something that does. I think about that idea of people talk about like seeking justice, mm-hmm. loving mercy, walking humbly. And you can talk about like self-help, find out who you are. But you answering those people's prayers mm-hmm. without even knowing it, mm-hmm. it gives you a kind of purpose. I love how thoughtful you are, by the way. I'm just watching you. Mm-hmm. Like every word you say matters to you. You're so in, you're so deeply trying to serve when you communicate. I just want to acknowledge that about you. Mm-hmm. I think that's a beautiful thing. I'm watching you really want to give your best mm. in everything you do mm. and that's rare so i just want you to know visually i'm watching this man mm. dig as deep as he can the holy spirit's all over him mm. and just uh choose the right words so anyway i just want to make sure i acknowledge that no, thank you yeah. for saying that yeah, it's true now words matter man like mm. words can build up mm. people words can destroy people mm. You choose yours beautifully. Mm. I just want you to know that. But you were going, you were talking a little bit about, I want to make sure that we don't, I didn't take that thought from you for a second too, but also this notion of, you know, when you're in service and also the notion, I think we we're also going to talk about a little bit there. I was going to let you go down the road a little bit of, you know, that the, there is something more. Yeah. Yeah. Just I'm like my highlights. And as you're saying it now, mm-hmm. like new thoughts are coming up. Mm-hmm. My, my happiest, let me not say happy, it's, but my the moments that brought me the most joy throughout my life and career, I think about times in Nigeria hmm. serving. Really? Yes. Yeah. I'm talking about like, no, there's no light, no running water. Hmm. You know, the time where you go and visit like the hospital, those times. Uh, I think about times being injured in the NFL. Really? Yes. When I, what did I do? I mean, cause it's like, oh, I gotta go make the team and be the star. And I made the team. I was a star. I signed the contract. But my highlight of my NFL career was 2018, where week four, I tore my pec. I was out for the season. I was supposed to be the starter. We traded for Khalil Max. We ended up getting the spot, which was awesome. Like He's a beast and still a friend. Um, but I get benched. I tear my pec. I'm out for the season. And I made a decision. And you talked about gratitude, but I decided to be who God really made me to be, hmm. which was to serve. Hmm. Like I, When I say I just sat with my teammates, I became a friend. It's hard. Like You talk about being lonely. Yeah. People got millions of dollars and zero friends. A lot of cars and no people to be You're right. with you in them. Mm. And I just became a friend mm. to my teammates. God bless you. Yeah. And something unexpected happened in that that year. I think we had eight different guys go to the Pro Bowl. <laughs> wow. Went to the our team went to the playoffs, best record in, in a decade. Mm. And you would say, Well, Sam, you weren't a part of I was every bit a part of that. Behind the scenes, That's awesome. loving people well. Like, so I would, I, I, you're not supposed to travel with an injury. I asked my coach, so one of my teammates was like, "Hey, man, can you?" I like pray with them before games, whatever. Mm-hmm. And I knew he wanted me there, and so it was an away game. I reached out to the coach, said, "Coach, is it cool? Like, if I travel?" He's like, "Yeah, sure, come on." He thought it was going to be study tape. No, I wanted to go be there with my teammate. That's awesome. The night before the game, I'd go to we do defense dinners and like hang out with the guys. I would we do this Bible study before you know before on um, Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays, 15 minutes before practice. I was so like, get up, I'd get up early. I do the study early. I go to my rehab because that's what the guys needed. That's wonderful. That, that was a highlight. Mm-hmm. And I've I've been to the playoffs a couple times. I, I was like second on the rookie sack record for Arizona Cardinals in my rookie year. Mm-hmm. But that wasn't happiness. That wasn't the highlight. That though. wasn't. It was that year when I when I was sure I was physically injured, yeah. but spiritually I was alive. See, that's what I meant earlier. By the way, that is one of my favorite things I've ever had an athlete tell me in my darn life. And that's mm-hmm. what that goes back to is your commitment to your teammates wasn't conditional. Mm-hmm. It wasn't conditional that I'm starting. Wasn't conditional that I make the Pro Bowl. Wasn't even conditional that I'm suited up. It was non conditional love and support, unconditional. And that's that's the real leaders. I want to go to some hard questions for you about pursuing change overall. Because, like you said, the, the genesis of the book started really in 2020 with George Floyd. I'm sure this was ringing in your head prior to that. I'm sure. 
but then that was a catalyst. And then just the catalyst of overcoming adversity in all of our lives. You tied them both together, by the way, beautifully in the book. But I wonder what your advice would be regarding discouragement. So you and I are both Christians, and it's not talked a lot about in the book, but I wanted to ask you about this because I really believe the adversary's great weapon. See, if I want to get you, if I'm the adversary and I want to get you to quit on your dreams, I'm going to use one weapon against you, which is discouragement. I'm going to get you to believe you can't do it. I'm going to get you to believe things can't change. I'm going to get you to believe it's too big. It's too insurmountable. You don't know enough. You're not well enough connected. You don't have the resources. You're not smart enough. It's anything I can do to discourage, right? And I wonder even from a societal standpoint, you know, we see these things still repeatedly happen. It's discouraging, right? We see things in our own lives where if we're in pursuit of changing something for our family, we want to be the change agent, generational change in our family, and we have failure or setback or discouragement is the killer of change. It's the killer of dreams, right? How have you in your own life dealt with discouragement, both from a societal standpoint and just a personal standpoint in your own life. At one point, your career had to end too, right? Yeah. So what about discouragement? What are the weapons you use if there's weapons you use to fight against it? Hmm. Good friends. Okay. <laughs> um, like I get discouraged a lot mm-hmm. by sometimes my own thoughts or other people's thoughts, actions, or maybe a misinterpretation of someone's thoughts, actions, etc. And there's a few things. Number one, sometimes it's good friends, not always, because mm-hmm. sometimes it's like, where are you guys? Yep. But memories sometimes help. Like, at the, so here's what I mean: the times where I'm the most at my like my deepest discouragement. And I think of, I'm, I'm thinking about a distinct time. Remember, I was at my parents' house a couple of years ago. I don't know what was going on. Maybe months ago. A couple, of, couple. I don't know what was going on, but I was just sitting on like the steps of their house. And I was just sad, mm-hmm. and something told me to go to my phone. And just start going back through some of the old pictures. Mm. I don't know what it is about mm. going back to those m- memories or those markers. And I've done it a few times now. And mm. it hadn't been this planned thing. Okay, I'm so discouraged. I'm going to go to my phone. Mm. But it's like, just some of those pictures, like, man, life is not as bad as I thought. You're right. And there have been some highlights. Mm. And God is still good. Mm. And there are things to be happy about. And even though I'm, I might be sad now, like, man, like, there were happy times. And oh, by the way, those times will come again. Mm. This too shall pass. Yes. But but we don't have mo- memory markers to remember that. And mm. go, you're talking about being a Christian. Like the, the, God would remind his people, like the Israelites, like, hey, hey guys, like I want you to remember this moment. Mm. Put this marker down. Mm. I want you to go and like remember, write it down. There's a verse. Uh, it, it, they would like sing, sing it in songs in Psalm like 115 and 116, like when they, when they were, came out of captivity, they would talk about these things, right? Not to us, O oh Lord, not to us. Mm but to your name give glory Mm. because of your loving kindness, because of your truth. Mm. Why should the nation say, where now is their God? But our God is in the heavens. Mm. He does whatever he pleases. So good. Their idols are silver and gold, the works of man's hands. They have mouths, but they cannot speak. They have eyes, but they cannot see. They have ears, they cannot hear. They have noses, but they cannot smell. They have hands, but they cannot feel. They have feet, but they cannot walk. They cannot make a sound from their mouths. Hmm. So like that, that was like a a song that they sang, a song that they said to themselves to remember, like, no, we're giving God the glory. Hmm. And so the times when I get discouraged, Ed, Hmm. it's a, I'm not, it's a simple thing. It's like a kind of just like, oh, minutia. I'll go back to my phone and I'll go all the way through my pictures, all the way to the top. And one of the first pictures is a picture of me playing football in like seventh grade. (laughs) And I was playing tight end. And another, another one is when my wife and I first met. Before we, not first met, but first started getting like yeah. close and just us hang, hanging out and laughing. Another one is when I proposed to her, like, there's these things. things. And I'll scroll down a couple and I'll see like a picture of my daughter when she was like 18 months old. It's beautiful. And she's in my car and like as a two years old, like, putting on like fake makeup, you know? Mm-hmm. It's like, they, so in those moments of discouragement, there's always a way out. And the Bible talks about like, hey, when you're tempted, God's always going to give you a way out. And that's mm-hmm. true. But I also believe that God gives us a way out during discouragement as well. And I think he gives us his spirit to remind us of these things. And sometimes he gives us a, a phone right. to remind us of those things. Because discouragement is real. Brother, it's unbelievable how much we kind of think alike. You ever, and don't do it, by the way, if you're listening to this, but every once in a while I'll get something on my feed where it shows like fighting. Mm-hmm. Like a student fight at a school. And if you flip the screen, it'll give you the next fight. I think everyone probably knows what I'm talking about. The next fight, you watch some human being beating up, and and it's a 
it's terrible to acknowledge, but I'll watch it. Oh my God. And then I'll watch the next yeah. one and I'll watch the next one. I'm like the cruelty of man mm-hmm. against another man. Mm-hmm. And it's discourages me. It's those are the things that harm my spirit. The most mm-hmm. It's not in my life. It's never been like failure. It's like, I'll figure a way to win. God's on the throne. I'm going to win. It's, it's man's inhumanity to man mm-hmm. is breaks my spirit, hurts my spirit. And I allowed myself, I'm being vulnerable here, I allowed myself to watch like 11 of these videos in a row. I know all of you know what I'm talking about. They're all over social media. I'm like, oh my gosh, and this guy beat up his teacher. And this guy, three of these guys kicking this boy in the head and he's passing. And I just cannot imagine a human being doing this to another human being. And then I start going, yeah, people suck. You know, people are mean. Maybe I've misjudged humans. And I did exactly what you did. I actually flipped all the way back to my phone and I watched all these little pictures of my daughter when she was just a baby and my daughter on my lap and my daughter hugging me. And then it made me thinking, man, daddies love their daughters. And then I literally used social for a good thing. I watched videos of fathers with daughters, like inspiring videos, which flipped to other things with like just kind people helping kind people. And I'm like, okay, there's a balance here. There is good in the world, right? And my job by one millimeter of one millimeter of one percent is to move the needle the good way. That's what my calling is in my life. But this notion, what we do, everybody to ourselves, is when our dreams failing, our life is bad. We begin to believe there's there isn't a way out. There is no way. Everything is against us. It's never going to change. Those are all lies of discouragement. There is a way out. God does provide a way out. It won't last forever. All pain is temporary, right? There is salvation. So, just remember, you start stacking these lies, like I was stacking these videos and it becomes a pattern and you do one in your mind after another in your mind, after another in your mind. And it's not reality. And I just want you all to hear that he's smiling as big as he's ever smiled. So I know I'm onto something there, but I just want to acknowledge that. And these thoughts, and I want you to jump in. These thoughts are contagious. These negative thoughts you say in the book, so are dreams. There's a chapter about that. So Add what you wanted to add and then talk about the contagiousness of dreams. Well, I love what you I love everything you just said. Thank you. For a few reasons. Mm-hmm. You're talking about going back and watching the tape. Mm-hmm. There was a point in my career, probably year four, so I I year three, I'm starting and I'm the guy and all the things. Mm-hmm. Year one and year two, like I'm starting, boom. Well, year three, I break my leg. Oh. Out for the season. Mm-hmm. Have a new coaching staff. Well, half the team gets cut. Mm-hmm. I make the team, but then the injury, and then you know, year four, I'm still trying to recover. And I wasn't I wasn't playing bad i wasn't playing great either okay but it was still you know it was like and i started getting better and better and better but it was still trying to still be more but all of a sudden like i heard coaches and teammates like even media a little bit like man this guy's bad you're not this you're kidding and i started to believe it and you know there's a little bit you said the net criticism versus haters and i yeah. said okay let me see where i can get better so we're working on getting better but i'm still either not hearing anything or hearing just negative mm-hmm. i'm like what is going on <laughs> but then i went back and watched the tape I went back and I watched the tape mm. objectively and went back mm. and just watched. And I said, oh, wow, I'm actually pretty good. <laughs> good, yeah. Take out the opinions, mm. whatever. It's like, no, this is actually just, just judging by the technique. Mm. Just, go back and watch the tape. You go the, the picture with your daughter. Oh, wow, like I have been present. Yeah. I know I travel a bit, but I have been present. Yeah. Oh, wow, like I, I, I have been a good husband. Why, what mm. it, it's like, oh, wow, like there is good in the world. Yeah. So we believe the lies. But I would actually go back and watch the tape. Gosh, that's good. Right I'm there. telling you, because it'll ch- it changed everything for me. Yeah, that's good. I legit was sitting there like, man, I'm just horrible player. Mm-hmm. And I went back and watched. So you know what? They they actually may have been wrong. Mm-hmm. And what if I'm right? Mm-hmm. And, and and I think the spirit of God helps remind us of that truth. You are re- bazillion percent right on about that. Yeah. And I just really believe that what we think about expands and they become things and they become patterns. And the more something's repeated over and over again, you use the word in the book. You actually use the word contagious. Yeah. I want to combine two thoughts in the book because I just believe you're brilliant. I just believe you're brilliant. I also believe there's wisdom scripturally and in my own life to validate what you speak about. Mm. But you talk about two things in the book, and I'll, I, cause I'm not going to cover every chapter. Dreams are contagious, and also simultaneously, your dream is not just for you. This is huge, everybody, right here. And I'll add my little two cents to it after Sam discusses it. But what about it? What's contagious mean, and why is your dream not just for you? Dreams are like oxygen, or or maybe like they're like trees. You know, like the trees that produce. It's like when you start breathing it in. 
you don't realize you need it, but other people need it. Mm. Like those trees, oh, yeah, you know, reforestation. Right. No, do we need those? <laughs> right, right. If you cut those out, you're dead. Mm-hmm. You're dead. So those that, 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 that oxygen, like you breathe it out, and then all of a sudden you start living out your dream, start planting more trees. All of a sudden people are breathing more. They're dreaming again. Mm-hmm. And you start doing something, and someone joins us alongside with you. I remember even we talked about some of the stuff in, with, in 2020 and trying to figure out with, like, what do we do as athletes or people or what? And all of a sudden I started to follow through with this idea mm-hmm. or this dream. Then all of a sudden someone else who wanted to do something similar, they joined. And someone else said, maybe I can try that. And all of a sudden we built this thing. Mm-hmm. That started with one tree mm-hmm. that was planted and it was providing oxygen. Mm-hmm. And we think it's just a tree, but it's really a life giving gift. You, you doing this podcast, you, mm-hmm. you not, you showing up, mm-hmm. it's a life giving gift. And we think, oh, I don't have a platform. No, you do. You do. You do. Mm-hmm. And so there's a contagiousness. <laughs> there is. In, in you living out your dreams, you following your dreams, you find you you following your fire, getting the architects, there's that. But the second piece is your dreams aren't just for you because other people are on the other side of your dreams. And we think it's this great idea, but there are physical people, real people waiting for you. Maybe the result of whatever you do is going to help them, but more likely there's people to the left and to the right that are like, man, I always wanted to do that. And 15 years from now, you're going to look up and be like, it was that one conversation that had you go on this trajectory that changed my life. 100%. And then you'll remember, you won't see it because like you plant all these trees, you start building them. I want to step out of the book and into you for a minute. I watched you most every day you were on during the uh, George Floyd stuff and surrounding that. And there was something different about the way that you communicate. I just want to say something about you on that. It seemed to me. See, I believe that one of the keys of making your dream come true, whatever that dream is or whatever change you want to create, is your ability to enroll people in that dream. So when you say there's other people involved in your dream, you know, the way you really make your dreams come true, everybody, is that you connect it to the love of either other people or the change you could create because that love will be bigger than the adversity. And not enough people get emotionally connected to their love the love of their children they want to win for or their parents or their culture or their society or their country or whatever it might be. But if you can connect the dream to something bigger than the adversity emotionally, now you got a real shot. One of the ways to do that is you enroll people. You change hearts. You change minds. You get people to support you. And during the, uh, look, when the stuff happened with George Floyd, George Floyd is just one person. This has happened Things like this have happened lots of times. It's, there's a camera on George Floyd. And so we call it the George Floyd time of 2020. But the truth is, you know, this is something that's happened forever. And when it happened, there was a point, I don't care who you were, I don't care black or white, you're like, Whew, this is on here every single day. There was just a lot of it, right? You're like, at anything, there's actually some benefit to a little bit of a look away and then come back that gives you perspective than every message, every day, all the time. And I remember thinking, I kind of know what I'm going to hear when I turn the TV on. Even when I turn on ESPN, I kind of know what this is, what I'm going to hear. Except when you talked. And there was a few others, too. When you talked, I felt like, just like what you're doing today, you were um, judicious in your wording. And it seemed to me like that you didn't only just want to express a frustration. This is important. You didn't just want to express a frustration or a concern or a pain. But you actually wanted to communicate something that would get people to see your perspective, people who already may not have seen your perspective. I'm wondering if you were cognizant of that when you were on the air, that I want the dude watching this who doesn't get this to hear my perspective as opposed to just hear my frustration. And I, Let me tell you why I think this is relevant. When you have a dream, it's easy to go, I'm frustrated with this thing and I want to change it. I'm frustrated with you know, obesity and so I'm starting a fitness training company. Well, that's great, but at the same time, you have to change the hearts and minds of somebody to make them your client, to make them your customer. It's great you're pissed, right? That's great. I'm glad to know the reason you're doing this. But to really create a movement as an entrepreneur or to create a movement in cultural change, you have to enroll people in your vision. And that means you have to meet them somewhere and connect with them. So I wonder when you were on there, because I found myself watching you almost leaning in a little bit. Like, he has a perspective I don't have because I didn't grow up like him. 
And, but I didn't feel like, I, do you know what I mean when I say that? I think I'm saying it the right way. So I think that same application at that time applies to any dream or any change you want to create. Your frustration level should affect me emotionally because it moves me. But then what are you doing to enroll me to get me to see your perspective and come with you? Does that make sense? Or even or even to, yeah, it makes sense, but yeah. even to like have a runway for me to do something. Because hmm. I might be mad, but are you mad? And if you're not mad, then it doesn't. I mean, if I, you do want you don't do anything. All right, great. I'll do it myself. Or it's like, hey, if you could understand where I'm coming from, that's part A. Yep. It's like, okay, I get it. But then part B is, hey, what if we could do something about it? And what if we could do something together? What's the vision look like? What's the vision? Yeah. And I had a friend who said, man, like, because there's the fear, mm. and he talked about overwhelm that fear with vision. And so there can be fear in situations and change, and what, but it's like, what if there's something we could do together? So like, oftentimes what I'll try to do is say, whatever my fear, frustration, if, I may not have an answer, but if I do, it's like, hey, and here's something we're doing. We're going to do this. And for me, for a bunch of athletes, it was, hey, we're going to, we, you know, we, do we protest? And we've seen protest, protesting work. Do we, you know, post some stuff on social media? Do we, and when the nonprofit leader is like, hey, can you just come and listen to some of our kids? Come sit with them. Come spend time with them because they're hurting. And so we did. And then there was an action point too. That was action, but also I always wanted to go from listening to like actioning, mm -hmm. listening to moving. And so we went and checked out the neighborhood, mm -hmm. saw what was going on. We we saw yes, you know, you, you turn on the TV, you see looting, rioting, Chicago. We were, I was with the bear. We just finished my time with the bear, Chicago Bears, looting, rioting. But we said, is this stuff real? You know what? We took a tour, and we saw buildings boarded up. We saw glass on the ground. But we also saw a community that, in a lot of ways, it seemed like society had turned its back on. Mm -hmm. But it came from getting close. Mm. And then with that, it said, okay, what if there's something else we can do? Mm. So we got some athletes together. Hey, let's sit and let's meet again with these young, with these kids and see. So like, it's just this idea of we all want solutions, but many people, they stop at the frustration. Yes. And they don't provide that solution. Yes. If I could just provide you with a solution, then it's your decision. Do you want to take those easy steps? And sometimes it's easier for some, more easier than some than others. But do I take those easy steps? <laughs> Or do I just say no? Because it's easy if I'm just frustrated. Okay, cool. That's you. Mm -hmm. But hey, let's do something. Mm -hmm. Now you can say yes or no. Yeah, very good. You talk about pain in the book. And you actually call pain a primer. I think I'll just use it from a business perspective. I think it's oftentimes healthy to tap into someone's pain and then show them how you can alleviate it. Like, And sometimes you need to even point out to somebody that they're in pain. There's a lot of people in our culture today that suffer in comfort. I'm going to talk about this on one of my shows. They suffer in comfort. So they live their life suffering and they just try to add things to make that suffering more comfortable. So yeah, if I'm going to get a, I'm going to get a nice car. So now I suffer in a little bit more comfort or I've got a decent house or we took an, but you're still suffering as a human being because I believe humans suffer if they're not in pursuit of their potential. They're not in pursuit of their purpose. They're not in pursuit of the reason they were born to do something great. There's a suffering that comes with that. That's the ultimate suffering. Now there's all kinds of other suffering in life that's the obvious sufferings in life. But what most people try to do in their life is they don't try to alleviate their suffering. They try to just suffer in more comfort. And so and they, what it means is sort of avoid the pain almost. But you say, nah, pain's kind of a primer in life. It's okay to leverage that to some extent. So I'll let you talk about that. Yeah, it's a primer. Um, pain Pain precedes progress. Oh. We know that from we know that from like working out and lifting weights. We know that from I mean, go to talk about different founders, you listen to them, and so oftentimes we have failed, 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 then boom. Mm. Or this the reason I created this great company is it was a huge pain. Pain, pain precedes progress, and we want to avoid it. We want to just add all this comfort to our pain, and really we're dying on the inside. Yes. And so if we want to accomplish anything worthwhile in life, that we have to address those things. Yeah. We cannot just continue just to run or hide or just get more comfortable. Because that comfort still won't speak to the heart of what's what's not only irking you on the inside, but mm -hmm. eating you away and burning you up mm -hmm. on the inside. Mm -hmm. So sooner or later, we have to like get comfortable with with pain. Wow, that's good. If we don't, 
you'll what, I, I forget how you said it but it was it was really amazing mm. like but we'll die a slow death we do it's like an asphyxiation yeah it's slowly we don't even realize it's happening to us and little by little it's almost like that frog it's almost like in mm-hmm. the boiling bucket like mm-hmm. it's just one degree at a time and before you know it you're boiling and that's what happens in people's lives and then you get to the end of your life and you played scared and you don't get another one i you know i was with my dad when he died and 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 i can tell you my dad did not regret the things that he tried and failed in his life he didn't the things that he tried that didn't work out he didn't regret them my dad regretted the things that he didn't try my dad regretted the risks he didn't take i have a really good friend named dave hollis who recently passed away he's 47 years old and you don't know when your time's coming but so many people in their life they just live afraid they don't take risks And they're going to get to their end of their life and they're going to be loaded with regret that they didn't. And in the book, you talk about taking risks. It's actually a center. It's one of the things that you actually write about and that most people do stay in that really comfy place in their life. They don't vary outside of what their parents expected of them or what their their friends think they're capable of or what they might not be great at yet. They don't want to roll the dice because they're rather just suffer in comfort. Can I can I do something? Yes. How did you forgive your dad? Hmm. That's a great question. You mean for the drinking and the things in his life? Well, two things in my dad's case. No one's ever asked me that ever in my life, not even my family. Um, one, my dad did have a redemptive part of his story that um, – he did turn his life around. And so I watched him physically with his feet change. So it wasn't just his words. It was his feet. I watched him do his prayer every day. I watched him go to the meetings. I watched him put in the time and the effort. So there was that. The other part of it is that um, in my own life, I've come to this conclusion that I need to give people more grace, that I don't know what was done to my dad when he was young. I don't know my dad's experiences. I don't know the pain and the hurt and the perspective that my father suffered through either. And so what I was doing in my life, like most people, is I'm judging the pain that my dad caused me based on only my perspective. But I don't know what my dad saw when he was a child. I don't know what suffering or abuse my dad went through as a little boy. But I have to believe for someone to get that addicted to drugs and alcohol, he was trying to suppress some sort of pain in his own life as well. And so for me, it was the forgiveness came from grace, not from him being perfect. But that in my dad's life, he's a man who was suffering, who loved his family and did everything he could to change. But even had my dad not gotten sober, because a lot of people ask me that, they're like, hey, you know, what if your dad always stayed that way? The truth of the matter is, is that real love isn't conditional. It's not conditional on my dad's sobriety. It doesn't mean that I would need to have my dad around me all the time if he was drinking. I would never around my children had my, my dad been drinking and using drugs. But my love for my dad was not conditional. Real love isn't conditional on his behavior. Proximity is conditional, but not the love. And so that forgiveness came rather easily for me because I'm a sinner saved by the grace of God as well. And if every mistake I've ever made, people judge me by, well, that'd be wrong because they don't know what I've gone through to get there. And so that's how I forgave my dad. I hope that's a complete answer, but it's, it's the real answer. No one's ever asked me that. Why'd you ask me that? I'm curious. I've seen not only in my life, but even like lives of people, like I want to be a better dad, Hmm. you know, Hmm. and like, you know, my dad, you know, from Nigeria, fought in wars and like, you know, Hmm. tough dude, tough dude, tough dude, you know, and I feel like I'm different and I'm very like, hey, let's Mm -hmm. have fun, Mm -hmm. you know, and, um, but I do know there are things where I'm like, man, like, how can I love, like, I want to love people well. Me too. And so, like, as I'm sitting and listening, I just want to learn like, okay, what did, what did, what did you do? You know one thing I did pretty well? I'll give you something. I'm 51. By the way, man, can I give you a bigger list of things I wish I didn't do as a dad? Mm-hmm. Isn't that? Man, I don't want that list. Yeah, well, you know what I mean? Like, wish I was more present. Mm-hmm. I remember a time where these little things as a parent you remember where I yelled at my daughter. Been there. My dad was a yeller. And I vowed I would never yell. And I yelled at her. And I watched her face, you know, my little girl, her face shook. I scared my daughter. And it broke my heart. And I'm like, I can't get that back. I just, the, my job is to protect her. My job is that she feels the most safe with me. And I scared her because I was an emotional idiot in three seconds. Now, 
I gave myself some grace and I said, I'm never going to do that again. And I don't think I ever have since then, but I've made those mistakes. One thing I have done pretty well, brother, and I know you do a good job of this. I spoke real words of affirmation into my children. In other words, I didn't just love them. I believed in them. I believe there's a big difference between love and belief. And I think love is the most powerful thing in the world, but true deep belief in somebody, you are very rare. If I said to you right now in your own life, who are the, who's the one or two people in your entire life that truly believed in you the most? Anybody listening to this or even Sam Macho sitting across from me, who are they? Picture their beautiful face right now. That one that really, man, if you think too long about it, you'll get emotional. And there is only one or two or maybe three people at best in most of our lives that had the deep belief in us. They're the most important people in our lives. And I want to be those people in my children's life. I want to be the person they go, my daddy believes in me. A lot of dads love their kids, and I want them to feel immense love, but I believe in you, and I tell them over and over why I believe in them, and it's not just, I believe in you, you're great. I then link it to things about them that they intuitively know is probably true. So, Bella Boo, you're amazing. You know why you're so amazing? Because you love people so much. You care so much about people. You're so funny. You're so good at math. You're so fast. I'll link it to things she's great at. She goes, I am fat. I, I do care about people. And it's linked to something she knows is true, right? Maximus, your kind heart, your giving. My son was born loving God. One of those just, you know, those people like didn't have to teach it to him at all, right? Max, the way you love God. Like, yeah, I do. And so I want to build him from there because like I said with my dad, I think hurt people hurt people. And I think loved people love people. People who are believed in believe in people. Mm. And what Jesus did was two things, if we really are true. He loved us. He died unconditionally for our sins. He went through pain for our goodwill because he loved us more than the pain he would suffer mm. to the point earlier. But he also believed in us. He believed in us in spite of the mistakes and sins he already knew we were going to make. And that with my children is the profound thing, that the mistakes they're going to make doesn't change my belief. It's not conditional because the Lord's belief who loves me more than I even love my own children, which is hard to imagine for both you and I. Mm. And he knows all the mistakes I make. He knew them before I made them. He knows the ones I'm about to make I haven't made yet. Mm. And so that that means you deeply believe in me also. So I think that's probably it. Hmm. Whoa. <laughs> um, that's deep as a dad. Hmm. You know, because it's one thing to love your kids and to say you love your kids, nothing to believe, believe in them. It's different. Especially when you see your faults and your failures mm-hmm. in them. In them. Isn't that true? Boy, and true. still to believe in them. Mm-hmm. Like you said, like, you know, you talked about how, like, how God believed in us, mm-hmm. how Jesus believed in us mm-hmm. and believes still. It's, That's a powerful thing. It sure is. And knows our mistakes, knows our sins, knows the ones we haven't made yet. Most times, I think most people, their belief is pretty damn conditional. You behave, I believe in you. You behave, I'll love you. You misbehave, I don't believe in you. I don't love you. This whole notion of I'm really disappointed in you, that's the kind thing. I don't think that's a good thing to say to a child because the truth of the matter is I've made mistakes in my life as well. My belief in you, that doesn't mean I don't correct my children. Jesus rebuked the apostles. We're having a real faith discussion now, but that's okay. Jesus rebuked the apostles, so rebuke is right within our repertoire. But that rebuke came with love and belief. Most times as parents, as leaders in business, when we're in the process of correcting, criticizing, or rebuking, we remove love and belief in that moment, and we'll get back to giving it to them. But what if in the presence of love and belief, you can correct? Hmm. To me, that's most productive as a parent rather than the absence of it in the moment of correction. Do you know what I'm saying? Yes. Most of my corrections with my children, even in business, have been in moments of anger, if I'm being honest. I'm angry. I'm mad. And I correct and I believe. The anger and love can't coexist. So I try to not do those things in the moments of anger and do them in moments of love. That's easier said than done because I'm a sinner too and make mistakes. But overall, that's my belief as a father, as a friend, and as a businessman. Mm-hmm. is that I want that correction to come in love and in belief, not in the moments of the absence of it, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. You're really kind. <laughs> Thank you, brother. So no, seriously, you. you are really kind. and like <laughs> I probably sound more kind than I am, but thank you. Hmm. I appreciate that. I just, I mean, even just like not even listening, but like looking at you, you know, and like 
there's a kindness inside of you and there's like a like there is this like emotional intelligence thank you but more than that it's a strength and there's this like deep 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 kindness like i see like that like i see that in you thank yeah, you yeah yeah that's probably why i have such affection for you hmm. i see that as well by the way thank you you could not say something nicer to me hmm. and i accept that even though i'm not completely comfortable with it but okay. i accept that and i aspire to be I aspire to be more kind, a more gentle, generous. I think the strongest people, men and women, are so strong they can be kind and gentle. Mm. You and I were talking about that, about our mutual friend Jason Wilson. Mm. It's one of the things I admire most about him. In, in your case, I love multi-dimensional humans yeah. with depth. And the reason I was so desirous to have you on was from a distance, mm. I see all these dimensions to you as a man. I see an athlete, I see a man of faith, I see a black man, I see a man proud of his culture, I see a man who wants to create change. I see a man, not devoid, but with very minimal judgment of other people. Mm. Someone with an incredible calling, mm. uh, oratory skills off the charts. Mm. You're always, in life, you're always making people feel something. Mm. And what I love about you is, I think you make people feel good mm. and aspire to be better. There's three types, there's four types of people. There's people that make really almost no impact. Then there's motivational people. Motivational people are great. You're, we, you term it a motivational speaker. Or I'm called, you're a great motivational speaker, which is great. That, that plays to people's motives. Mm. If you do this, you can have a better life. If you do this, you can have a faster car. If you do this, you'll have a better marriage. If you do this, you have a better body. Plays to our motives, which is great. Then there's a very, very small group of people. They're inspirational. Inspirational people, they motivate us. Mm. But the root of inspiration is to be in spirit. Hmm. Something affects us from a spiritual perspective emotionally when they're in our presence. You have that, my friend. Hmm. And then there's real rarefied air, which is someone who is aspirational. And this is a human being that when we're in their presence, we go, I'd kind of like to be a little bit more like them. Hmm. And to me, you check all three boxes. You're motivational, you're hmm. inspirational, hmm. and you're an aspirational man. Hmm. I aspire to be more like you. Hmm. And if I ever have even one millimeter of 1% of that, I'd be really grateful. So I want to acknowledge you about that. Thank you for saying that. It's true. You're yeah. remarkable. Um, I want to also say one more thing, and I want to ask you one last question. Yeah. Um, I've enjoyed today tremendously. I have to. I don't know that I've had very many people on my show who are more thoughtful about the words they choose. They don't just throw you – don't, you don't throw words out, Sam. You don't. They're important to you. I'd like to meet your brother too. Yeah, he's awesome. I think it'd be a great conversation to me to have you both on together. Yeah, I think that'd be fascinating. Before I ask this last question, I want to remind everybody: uh, whenever you're listening to this, the book's out March seventh. So if it's after that, go get it. If it's before that, heck, go pre-order it. It'll probably be after that. Change starts with you following your fire to heal a broken world, and uh, you get the feeling, don't you, everybody? And by the way, his Instagram is the Sam Acho. So go there as well. Follow him on. On Instagram, while you're getting it, go grab the Power of One More by Ed Milet. I hear that book's pretty good too. Yes. But let me ask you this, lastly, because you're young, you're in the midst of making many, many dreams come true. Someone's sitting there and they go, "Okay, I'm going to get your book, and I want to do all these things, but I want to go back to the price thing for a minute. Be real here too. I've only asked three or four people this on the show. I think, is it worth it? to pursue your, whatever your change is in your dream. I, I, uh, I had um, Martin Luther King Jr.'s son on, so I guess he's MLK the third, mm -hmm. And uh, I wrote my dissertation on MLK, so I really wanted to interview him. And sometimes I think these people that have stood up in life to make change in their life, his life was literally taken from him, right? And I think of other people I know that, you know, they paid a pretty big price in order to make their dream come true. And so I wonder, like, was all the price you had to pay as a young man worth it to get to the NFL? Right now, is the price you're paying, because there's a price, as you said earlier. You're away from your family more. You got to travel. You're probably going to go to Connecticut to do ESPN. You got to go back there. You got more notoriety now. Now you got a book out. Now you're busy. Then you're pr the podcast. You got this. You got that. You got a family. You got friends. You, is all of it worth it? And I mean, if, it's, if the answer is no or I don't know, that's acceptable too. But what's yeah. the honest truth about that? You never know what doors are going to open until you walk through them. Hmm. And I'm not talking about the door that you walk through. I'm talking about the door that begets another door. In high school, I was not this, oh, I'm going to go in the NFL. I was, I didn't, that was not my thing. I, it wasn't, not even close. I was like, maybe I, I want to go to Ivy League or I don't know. 
And I got a chance to go and get a scholarship and, and, and go to play at Texas. And when I wanted to actually be good, because some people were just happy to be at Texas, oh, I made it. But I wanted to actually be good, there was a, a price to pay. I would I, I ate different. I drank different. I thought different. I worked out different. All these things were, I did them differently than others to get to that next goal of making it to the NFL. Mm-hmm. Then I made it to the NFL. And it opened up a lot of doors. But then it's like the average is three years. I want to, oh, I do want to actually do this. And there's a sacrifice. But all of a sudden, that that nine-year career provided a platform where people now want to listen to what I have to say. And by God's grace, God put something inside of me to get out. And right, that first book, that uh, Let the World See You, that came out right as, as soon as I tore my peg and out for the season and finished my career, boom, book number one. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden, we, you know, fast forward, and now I'm on ESPN, bigger platform, all the things. Right, because I played in the NFL, because I made those sacrifices all that long time ago, that I didn't even think, I did not think, okay, if I go to this college and then I stay healthy enough and then I go to the national championship game and then I go to the NFL and get drafted and I play nine years and then I'll go, because I'm not thinking about that. It's just a thing in front of you. So what is worth it is making that decision to take that risk, to, have, to make that call, to speak to that person, to address that issue, to ask that question, to answer that question. That's worth it because you never know what's on the other side to go address that thing that you've been afraid of. That's worth it. And I can't tell you, I can't tell you, I can't tell you what's going to come of it, but I can tell you that saying no, you will regret Hmm. and that not showing up, you will regret. I've, I've, I've I've closed some doors that I wasn't out of, out of anger Hmm. that I, I don't want to use the word regret. But I'll use the word regret. <laughs> I'm like, man, I wish I would have been. I wish I wouldn't have let my emotions get the best of me in that situation. And but God and God still does redeem. But what I will say is, and and I, I don't want to just flippantly say that God redeems broken things, and broken people, and broken situations. All those eleven videos that you flip through, God can and will redeem that, whether in this life or the life to come, He will. So and we've seen that with you've seen that with your family. I've seen that with mine. So is it worth it? Hands down, absolutely, yes. But you may not know for 15, 15 years. That's so true. And I'm seeing that right now. The decisions I made by God's grace, my parents made to put us in the schools we went to, to go to this football camp at USC that we didn't even know back in 07 or 06. We showed up at this camp. It's an invite-only camp. We weren't invited, but we still got a chance to get in this camp. All of a sudden, boom, scholarship. Top 300 camp. Top 300 kids from the entire state of California. And me and my brother. And for whatever reason, boom, we I blew up and – Scholarship because we showed up and then that scholarship had all the other schools offer. Now every school's offering, right? Oh, boom. I pick a school. I go to that school. I decided to be disciplined. Notice I decided to be disciplined. It's a decision. And we make mistakes, but I decided all of a sudden for the opportunity, I didn't know if I was going to get drafted or not, but I did. I went to a team and I decided then that this wasn't going to be the end. I made it to the NFL. No, I want to be a starter. I want to set records. I want to go to the Pro Bowl. Why? I'm not really sure yet. I just want to honor God. But it's like, but all of a sudden that that effort led to something. No, I never made a Pro Bowl. I was nominated twice, never made a Pro Bowl. Uh, I never, you know, set the sack record. I was second as a rookie. You're right. Pretty good. Yeah. And it opened doors. Mm-hmm. And then he and then I, I studied film. Mm-hmm. I wanted to be good. I want so all of a sudden now now ESPN, I'm using what I did my NFL career. Gosh. I, in school, I would work, I loved writing. Mm-hmm. Like I, I could recite Shakespeare. I can I, I, those are things that I love when I was little. And now I'm using that to memorize things. Right now I'm mem- trying to memorize like scripture and the word of God, not to impress people because I need it. So it's like, is it worth it? Absolutely, yes. Mm-hmm. And you may not know why. I don't either, but God does. God shows up on the other side of fear. Brother, what a remarkable conversation today was. Yeah. Look at the heads back in the studio in the sound room. They're nodding too, and that ain't normal, just so you know. <laughs> What a great conversation. I'm uh, truly um, grateful and honored I got to share the hour with you. It was awesome. And if you don't come back here and do this again, there's <laughs> something wrong with both of us. Yes. I would love to do this again. I would too. Yeah. God bless you, brother. Make sure you go grab his book, guys. Change starts with you, following your fire to heal a broken world. And please share this episode. There's so much juice and stuff in here for the people you love and care about and believe in. Share it with them. If you believe in them and you love them, you'd share this with them. Take care, everybody. God bless you.